I see all the participants have entered. I will go to you guys. Okay. We'll see you soon. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to AAMA's webinar, Preparing to Reopen. Your moderators today will be Pete Gustafson, the AAMA Executive Vice President, and Joe Camerata, our AAMA President. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, go ahead, Joe. No, no, just good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're this is our third in a series of webinars dealing with the coronavirus. And uh, this one's very exciting because it's on the lip of edge of, of everyone's tongue. And that is reopening. How right are we going to reopen? But at least we're talking about it. It's on the table. It's on the menu. It's on the discussion. And uh, this is, this is going to be a very, very exciting one because we're all looking forward to getting our facilities back open. But before we do that, we got to think about a couple things. So um, with any further ado, Pete, let's uh, introduce our, our panels. Yeah, sure will. But before I do that, I want to introduce a couple of people who've worked very hard in putting all this together and have been my uh, team members throughout this. And that's Tina Schwartz and Alex Reichstorf. They're the other part of PTA, Pete, Tina, and Alex. Uh, they're, yeah, they're all, their work often takes place behind the scenes, but it most certainly does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. So thank you, team members. Uh, today's program will begin with an introduction of the panelists, followed by a series of questions we prepared and supplied to them prior to today's webinar. Uh, the idea is to quickly move to questions from you, the audience. Uh, you can pose those questions by typing them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, and you can begin to do so now and throughout today's program. We'll do our best to get, get, it, to, get to as many of your questions prior to the end of the webinar as possible. There will be a series of poll and chat questions appearing during the presentation for you, the audience, to answer as well. The results of the polls will be posted during today's presentation, so please answer them as, as they appear so we can post results as quickly as possible. We're joined today by six extraordinary panelists from a variety of disciplines, including manufacturing, family entertainment, themed restaurants, medical research, and business and corporate training. So let's introduce our panel. Cheryl Bindelkrass is the CEO of Cheryl Golf, a nationally recognized business and handsome firm serving the golf, recreation, family entertainment, and re retail industries for over 20 years. Their mission is to deliver practical, easy to implement solutions that increase your profits and improve your operations while keeping your core customers happy, entertained, and most importantly, returning. Welcome, Cheryl. We've lost uh, again. Jack Cook is the president of Bob Space Racers. Bob Space Racers, or BSR, is an amusement manufacturing consulting firm based out of Holly Hill, Florida, where it's a lot warmer there than it is here today in Chicago. <laughs> uh, the company has a worldwide presence in the amusement industry uh, with products in use in arcades, family entertainment centers, amusement parks, and carnivals. And the company has equipped and operated in, in over 100 countries, so they're pretty well spread around the world. Jack's career with BSR goes back 44 years and, uh, and when he was promoted to uh, president in 2008. Uh, Jack is actively involved in game design, facility design, manufacturing, merchandising, amusement operation, and training game man managers in multiple countries. So welcome, Jack. Thank you, thank you for having me. You bet, man. Uh, Frank Cosentino is the senior vice president at Bandai Namco Amusements. Frank started his amusement industry career uh, almost 40 years ago, right around the same time I did. Uh, for the past 29 years, he's been with Bandai Namco, where he, sta he started as their director of sales. Today, he's part of the management team that runs the company, where, he, where his focus includes product development, manufacturing, parts and customer service, logistics and marketing. And he's currently serving uh, with me as secretary of the AAMA and as a past president of the association. Welcome, Frank. Hi, guys. 
Dr. John Gustafson, that name might seem familiar to you. He's my brother. He let a lot more books than I did. He's an expert <laughs> in antimicrobial oh, resistance who presently serves as professor and department head at the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Department at Oklahoma State University. Over the past eight years, he's been tasked with improving the department's educational programs and aligning future research programs with the strategic objectives of the Division of Agricultural Science and Natural Resources. He previously held positions at New Mexico State University in Las Cruces, where he served 10 years on the faculty and four years at administrative positions, ultimately rising to biology department head. Since beginning his 24, acad 24 year academic career at the School of Biomedical Sciences in Curtin University of Technology in Perth, Western Australia, Dr. Gustafson has been successful at securing millions of dollars in grant funding to support his research on antimicrobial resistance in bacterial pathogens and recently in scientific education. His research efforts have been disseminated to a wider scientific audience in numerous publications, presentations, and invited lectures. Recently, he and his team converted their lab at OSU into a COVID-19 test processing center. They are effectively working in spacesuits, processing as many as 1,300 samples a day, which may contain a highly contagious pathogen with no known counter therapy. One misstep in safety protocols or procedures creates a potentially life-threatening situation. And that's placing him and his team at the point of the spear in the battle with this <laughs> pandemic. Thank you for joining us today, John. Um, Mike Leatherwood has, uh, has been in the restaurant business for 50 years and today is the founder and CEO of Bone Daddy's House of Smoke, a six location chain of themed restaurants throughout North Central Texas and Good Union Urban Barbecue with two locations in the greater Dallas metro area. He's also a partner in the home building firm Modern Living. I've had the privilege of knowing Mike since 2007 when I relocated to Dallas to head up LAI Games. I enrolled in a leadership program and Mike was my coach and he turned out to be a mighty good one. Uh, we remained close friends making time every other Tuesday to have breakfast together at Pete's Cafe on Beltline Road in Farmers Branch, a suburb just north of Dallas. Those casual get togethers are one of the things I miss most about leaving Dallas. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome Mike. Thank you Pete, it's good to be part of this. Yeah, man. And uh, the last member of our panel, uh, many of you know, Jonah Sandler is the founder and CEO of Scene 75 Entertainment. Uh, he, this was founded in 2012, and its five locations have a lengthy list of awards to its credit, including having been named by IAPA as the top family entertainment center in North America for 2016. Jonah joins us from Ohio, where he was named as one of Dayton's most influential leaders as a 40 Under 40 award recipient. He presently serves as the Dean's Corporate Advisory Board at Wright State University and advises Facebook on its marketing tools as an inaugural member of Facebook Small and Medium Business Council. Jonah graduated summa cum laude from Washington University in St. Louis in 2004 and with MBA honors in 2009 from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Jonas is a CFA char charter holder and also the author of Before the Door is Open. I happen to have a copy of the book right here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm embracing the marketing journey of Sieve 75. Uh, welcome, Jonah. Welcome. Thanks. It's an honor. Thank you. And uh, let me just get to us to the questions uh, that I have for the panel. Uh, we'll get started. And one of the things we want to talk about today is uh, SOPs. And uh, I'm sure each of you have your uh, own specific uh, uh, group of SOPs for getting your facilities open. Um, with that regard, um, uh, Mike, what you've already opened uh, one restaurant with 25% capacity. Uh, you had some marginal success over the weekend. Uh, tell us about what uh, some of the SOPs you've had to employ uh, to, to open the restaurant so that both your team members and the community feel self safe and secure in entering your facility. Sure. So just starting at the front door, uh, we have someone that opens the door for our guests, both going in and out. Uh, because we are limited to 25% capacity, that same person has a, a counter that counts people going in and out to make sure that we don't uh, bust our occupancy load. Uh, obviously, our sanitation standards have gone way up. Uh, we are uh, double sanitizing every table, making sure that we're using uh, clean cloths every single or fresh cloths every single time we clean. Uh, 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 gloves in the kitchen. We're trying to maintain social distancing in the kitchen. Uh, we've got every other table closed. 
uh, but even at that, we don't seat that many tables because we're limited to 25% occupancy. We're also limited to six guests per table, so we've got no large parties. And uh, we are considering going to reservations only so that we can control the number of people that are even waiting for a table. Uh, we've had to change the way we handle our pay methods. We're looking into providing all of our guests with opportunities to pay at the table so that we don't have to handle their credit cards. We're, we still don't have all the kinks worked out on that. Um, we've also tried to increase our to-go and delivery business. That was typically about 1% of our sales, uh, but we've had to make changes because of our limited limitations on occupancy to try to build our business somewhere else. Um, when our food comes in the, in the back door from our suppliers, we're taking everything out of the boxes if it's something that we can wash, we wash it immediately before it goes on our storage shelves or in our walk-in coolers. And then we discard the boxes before they ever even come into the building. So those are just some of the things that we've been doing differently. Mm. So it's a challenge, but uh, you're managing it. And 40% uh, um, um, uh, same, same uh, day sales uh, as last year, I guess. Is that what you were comparing them to earlier? Just pre, pre-COVID sales. Okay. And, and, and was that, um, that meet your expectations or really you didn't have any expectations? I didn't have any. We're just, it yeah. was this, again, we've got eight restaurants and we're looking at when it's, when it makes sense to open them. So yeah. we started with our busiest location to see whether or not we could make it, make it work there. And if we could, then we'll look at opening the second busiest location and so on. So uh, it's still too early to tell. We'll, we'll, we will look at it on Friday after we've been open for an entire week and make a determination about how to go forward. Uh, one of our issues is, though, that uh, you know, staffing issues are a problem, and also the fact that our inventory is perishable. So when we got shut down in mid-March, we got zero warning, and so we ended up having to throw away tens of thousands of dollars worth of wow. perishable food. We couldn't even get food banks to take it. So uh, we have to be very careful about how much product we're bringing into the restaurant, because we don't know if, you know, two weeks from now, they shut us down again. Wow. Um. Uh, uh, Jack, um, you've got a factory running down in Florida. Um, you've got your staff up there putting product together. Tell us about some of the, st the standard operating procedures you've had to establish uh, to uh, uh, keep things safe and secure. Well, we just got back open Monday after a uh, four-week uh, furlough from the uh, state of Florida, shutting everything down. Uh, we've opened back up and we are staggering lunches. We're staggering breaks. We're, uh, we're uh, supplying our employees with masks. Uh, it is an optional to wear a mask because they are very hot. Uh, you can fog your glasses up, so they are very uncomfortable to try to work in the heat of Florida, which is getting very hot down here right now. We had a meeting Monday. Uh, everybody come in at 8.30 uh, for a shop meeting, and we talked about all the uh, uh, SOPs to keep distances apart, the staggered lunches, like I say. And, uh, you know, we're a close-knit bunch here. It's the same people coming in every day, so we're not dealing with the public. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, customers coming in the door. So we're, our biggest concern is at what happens to our employees outside of work and then bringing that back into work. So uh, all of our employees understand how, what a, a fragile situation we're in. It only takes one employee to come in the door with, uh, with it's been exposed to this virus. And then all of a sudden the, uh, the whole place is going to be shut down again for, for a couple of weeks to, to quarantine everyone. So uh, right. we're asking everyone to please follow the SOPs, follow the procedures, use some common sense. Uh, we have hand sanitizer all over the factory and to think about their fellow employee because if they bring something in here, um, like I said, I don't think we're gonna catch it from within the inside, but if they bring something in, uh, you know, we could be totally shut down. And uh, we have, you know, quite a workload uh, ahead of us here because uh, we have quite a few orders. Uh, the factory is full of, of supplies and and games that are built ready to go out, which if we start opening up, everybody's gonna want everything at once. So we have to get caught up on that. We also built a, um, a ventilator out of one of our game mechanisms. Wow. And the, it was a big ventilator shortage and the, everything was gonna be ventilator, ventilator. And we built a, a mechanism that would squeeze a, um, a bag valve like you would have in a, a fire, they would resuscitate you with a valve. Sure. We had a mechanism you could set the valve in and would, and would pump that. That kind of went off to the wayside, but now we're, uh, I should see it today, but we'll have our first prototype of a, uh, a hand sanitizer, hands-free hand sanitizer that you would operate with your foot and 
sanitize your hands, which I think is going to be, be a big thing for our customers uh, at the games and uh, in their environments. And uh, there's quite a few of them on the market, but we're making making one that will have readily available because it seems like every, everything is back ordered right now. You can't get anything. So yeah. uh, it's uh, it's been an interesting, interesting times for us. Mm. That's something else, Pete, that we're doing is around, uh, we have disposable menus, we're having to use disposable uh, you know, plastic wares to the silverware. Uh, we can't have any condiments on the table, so we have to bring out ketchup and salt and pepper as it's uh, requested by the guest. So those things have changed as well. Wow. I saw a comment uh, from uh, some of the participants about um, hours of operation. We have not changed our hours of operation yet. Uh, we're waiting to see what happens this first week before we make that determination. We're also looking at the possibility of doing a more limited menu uh, during this process. Yeah, and the questions are they're asking kind of lead to a, uh, a series of questions I had relative to uh, uh, bringing people back into the facility, whether it's a factory or a family entertainment center or what have you, what protocols will you put in town? And this is the first poll we've got. So uh, attendees, please feel free to uh, uh, enter your answers, um, uh, check all that apply. Um, are you requiring temperature checks uh, for guests and team members? Are you requiring team members and guests apply hand sanitizing agents to their hands before they enter? Uh, are you requiring team members and guests to wear masks? Uh, and will you be requiring team members and or guests to answer questions about their potential exposure to C-19 and their own well-being? And I'll open that up to, uh, let's, uh, Jonah, have you given some thought to that? Absolutely. So first, thanks for having me. I'm just honored to be a part of this brilliant group. I mean, I'm truly impressed. So thank you. And I wish we were all meeting under different circumstances. Amen. So true. So true. So true. Um, you know, we are still quite some time away from opening. Uh, we have, as of this week, allowed some of our general um, staff of management to enter our buildings, but thus far we've stayed away. So as they are in our facilities, they are wearing masks and they are separated throughout our large facilities to have separate workspaces and so forth. Um, you know, we do intend once we open, and clearly this is evolving daily, but we've we put together a, a playbook and it continues to evolve. And we do anticipate taking the temperature of our team members. We do anticipate requiring the mask for our team members. We are going to provide multiple hand washing break shifts throughout their, their shifts so that they can also take comfort in, uh, uh, in their cleanliness procedures. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna have quite a bit of signage throughout our venues from the doorways to uh, social, social distancing markers in the queue lines and so forth. Uh, we are restricting capacity uh, as, as Mike mentioned with the clicker, one thing that we've pretty much always done in our operation is we have security at our entry door who typically opens the door for our guests anyway. So we're going to do some double coverage and, and further allow them to open the doors, provide some sanitation of the, the handles and, and uh, measures like that. We are, uh, as Mike also mentioned on the food and beverage side, we are going to be using disposables from menus to utensils. Uh, we're going to have a more limited menu and you know as, as far as the hours of operation at this point we don't intend to tweak our hours but that being said we have actually always been closed on Mondays and Tuesdays and we feel that that's also going to uh, play to our advantage to some degree here as it gives us additional time to showcase and uh, put into practice all of our deep cleaning measures that we feel are going to be required and it's, it's not something that's been new to our uh, attraction operation, but it is certainly something that we are going to uh, make sure that guests are aware of, as we feel that for us, it's, it's an important, important component to ensuring that get games are well maintained, uh, attractions are safe, and that we're putting in place the proper sanit sanitization procedures, even when they're not in the building. Great stuff. Um, uh, Cheryl, for you, I got a question for you. Um, uh, you know, you certainly are familiar with um, marketing and promoting uh, and getting people in the building, getting them to stay there for longer and getting get back and then to come back more often. As C19, in this new C19 world, how is that marketing methodology going to change? What, what do we need to be doing uh, to make our guests and team members feel more comfortable through marketing activities 
um, uh, you know, what, what, what is that, what is that going to look like? What's our, what, what do you would recommend uh, to communicating uh, via marketing for our guests and team members? First, thank you so much for having me with this amazing group of people. I am so honored. And these are challenging times. And while I can market any hour of the day, any product, whether it's a widget or a service, this is totally different. The first thing we are going to all have to do as an industry and individual properties is win their trust. As I said, nobody out there is saying, oh, pick me. I want to be a guinea pig. I have to go and make sure that, you know, I survive so my friends will come. We've got to switch our message. No sales, no you know, rush in today, book your birthday party. It's really got to be, we care. We care about our community. We care about our guests. We care about our team members. And everybody's been using a great expression, which is it's the cleaning theater. When you are cleaning, make sure it's so visible. Do videos, put them out there. Communicate with your team, with the community and with your guests. So when Jonah was mentioning He's going to have signage and decals and whether they wear buttons that say we clean every 30 minutes. It's really something that we've got to be very proactive. We want to put a couple of people just in white t-shirts that are special branded Mr. Clean or Mr. and Mrs. Clean and let the company that they're around see that they're constantly cleaning. Some of the basics that everyone's doing, we were doing it all along. We need to promote that, hey, of our surveys, 99% of the people said this is the cleanest park they'd ever been. Hmm. What else can we do to help you feel comfortable? I think proactively on your social media platform where you will say, okay, we use great card on one side of the card. It shows what we are doing. We're checking temperature, we're washing our hands, we're doing and list all the things. On the other side of the card, it could say, here's what we expect our guests to do. Please don't visit us if you're not feeling well. Please make sure you wash your hands before and after each attraction. Please, you know, and just list the things that we expect them to do. So it's a, quote, marketing piece, but a communication piece. And I think I should have bought stock and hand sanitizers. But Jack, I'm definitely ordering 100 of your foot pump hands. Uh, <laughs> hands. I could go on about marketing for the whole thing, but I just wanted to give a quick summation and get people thinking about more caring, more understanding. And think when you're training your staff, you know what? A lot of people are coming in, they're scared. Yeah. They may not have the income that they had. They definitely don't have the same money security that they had. So we really need to do an incredible job at welcoming them, making them feel great gradually. You know, I talk about the grandest grand opening. Right now, I go with a very soft, gentle, Let's ease our way into it and make sure the new standard operating procedures work. And that's not just for the guests, that's for the team members as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Get them to be a big part of the process. Show them what you're thinking about and say, where do you think we could be cleaner, less contact, or more um, distant, but still interacting? Hey, Cheryl, you mentioned trust. How would you go about establishing trust and maintaining trust? What, what, what would the focus be for, for everyone that's reopening? That's so, so awesome. I don't know who has already decided what system they're gonna put in for cleaning. Are you gonna use a UV system? Are you gonna do this spray method? Put a video of that and say, hey, we are here to protect you. This is the first thing we're doing. To earn their trust, it's gotta be baby steps. You don't get that trust overnight. Now, everything that you do, put it out there, public and social. I'll call Jonah out for just a minute. He posted the most amazing letter on LinkedIn. I read that, and I had total trust in his facility. He said, we are not open. Look, he's blushing, folks. We are not open until we're really, really ready, and we know that we can be safe for our staff and for our guests. And it's not going to happen overnight. It is not going to, you know, I've heard people say, oh, they've been stuck in their house for 48 days. They're going to come running in. That's not the case. And, you know, there have been several places that have tried it. And one facility only had two people come the whole weekend. Another said, hey, we were at 10%. You know, these are numbers that you're revving up your staff. But at the same point, you know, they're 
you're not ready to come back yet. And I think a lot of people have kind of gotten used to the fact that they can work from home. They yeah. can play at home. They can teach. At home. You know, what's it going to take to get them back in the doors? You know, one of the things we talked about for lots of locations is to help support the revenue before they get back. You know, so whether it's selling gift cards and saying, while you're buying this gift card, a portion of your gift card is going to help our staff. Or a portion of the gift card sales will go to the food bank. You know, start letting them know that you're human, that you really care about them. And it's going to take time. But that was a great question, Joe. Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that we're doing in our, in our township, <clears throat> you can work with local municipalities in that regard. Also, uh, we're having a, a special restaurant weekend where, we're, where, where the, the municipalities broadcasting through Nixle and their website, please visit our reps, restaurants. And we have the whole list of them, where you can contact them, how you can contact them, what they're offering and all that. So work, the point is here is working with your local municipalities in that regard, because they're willing and able. I, I know it on a firsthand basis. That's something we're trying to promote in our town. No, I think that's great. And I think you're seeing a lot of people in the United States that are partnering who used to be competitors who are saying, you know what, let's do this together and let's do yes. this. We're both doing cleaning, both offering masks. So here's a fun thing. When we talk about masks and should they wear it, shouldn't they? Um, there was some resistance on one of the other sessions that I did. And I said, make it a fun, interactive thing. When everybody walks in, if you don't have your own mask that you're handing out that are branded, Give them super cool bandanas and teach them how to use a bandana. Make it, we're about fun. Make it that it's something fun and, you know, not a negative, oh, you have to wear another face mask. You did bring a face mask that I played with. Yeah. See, we can do these, like, fun ones at home. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Yep. Um, My thanks. I got a question for uh, uh, Frank and, and, and Dr. John. Um, um, you know, there's been talk about, um, nanotechnology and microbacterial surfaces. Do such things exist? Uh, are, there, are, are there materials that uh, manufacturers could think about using in producing product that would uh, have some level of micro, you know, uh, pathogen uh, protection that it would kill it off or it couldn't survive on the surface? Okay, I, I guess I'll go first. Um, we are looking into that right now. I mean, there, from, what, um, from what we found so far, there is, there is nothing currently available on the market that has been proven to be effective against C19. Um, there, are, there are antimicrobials out there. There are um, a, number of different, um, a number of different types of uh, nanites, so to speak, you know, whether it be silver or copper or different types of active, um, active agents that, that can be combined into things like, say, a, a polyurethane that you could coat surfaces with that would then turn it into an active surface, which will reduce the amount of time that it would take for, that, for a virus or a pathogen to die on that surface compared to the surface itself. But again, nothing currently has been proven. There are things that are currently in testing with the FDA to see if it's if it can be proven to be effective with C19, but nothing has been proven as of yet. But there are some, there, there is some data out there that shows that potentially there may be some products like that coming to the marketplace. And no idea what the cost of those would be because they're not even developed yet. Well, well, I mean, there is a, um, there's like one product out there that's, um, that's actually a, a, a two-part coating um, polyurethane, which, which they use to like, coat like hospital floors they use it to coat like certain certain things which which costs about i think it's um it's about a buck a square foot to apply and uh, and it could be applied as like a um as a as a clear polyurethane say you wanted to coat a control panel with a with a clear poly or or, or something like that you could you could use that now again there's no there there's no hard data that says okay if if the it, it certainly will reduce the amount of time it would that the virus can live on the surface, but it's not like it can say, okay, if normally it takes this long, it's going to make it one tenth or one fifth or one twenty fifth or whatever of the amount of time that it would take for uh, for the virus to die on that particular surface. But it it is 
with things like staph and strep and, and previous coronaviruses and, and, um, and uh, other, you know, other agents, so to speak, it has been proven effective to help shorten the lifespan that it'll have on those surfaces. John, can you elaborate on that at all? Yeah, I totally agree with what Frank just said. I, I don't know of any information about in uh, uh, materials that are produced with antimicrobials such as triclosan. So I know there's triclosan literally was found in a lot of things, including household soaps for quite some time. But then the FDA told companies that th there was an issue with that because soap was just as effective, for instance, as antibacterial soap, which contained triclosan. And the companies couldn't prove that the triclosan containing soap was any better. Um, but I know they've done things like put this bisphenol triclosan actually in plastics and toys and a variety of other surfaces, to my knowledge. Um, and they're, I presume they're doing so because it's very effective against um, um, eradicating organisms or at least disallowing them to grow. Um, and the other thing, you mentioned copper, Frank. Yeah, I, I thought that hospitals were actually moving back to old copper doors and whatnot because metals, believe it or not, are toxic. Copper is toxic to a lot of microbes. But as Frank correctly said, they were targeting hospital-borne pathogens. Um, coronavirus, of course, is a community-acquired um, pathogen, so it's a little bit different. And um, whether or not these kind of materials will play a role, especially in your industries, um, I, I just I, I don't have any solid answers. And there is a um, there is a spray that we're looking into now that uh, that potentially in say you've got a um, you've already applied some type of uh, um, if if you if you've applied this polyurethane to certain surfaces right then in conjunction with there's a there's like I think it's a I believe it's a a silver ion spray or a silver nanoparticle spray that um, that is non toxic to humans and yet you'd be able to like wipe down the games or spray them down throughout the day and theoretically um, with again once this is proven we'll we'll have better information on it but theoretically you'd be able this this would be able to like be an active agent on these items if you're wiping them down during the day like say you wiped it down twice a day with these things it would you know kill it off in five minutes now that's not going to prevent like the next person who walks up into the game if they're right behind them from potentially getting something if someone's just sneezed or coughed or whatever right. on the game. Right. So, so again, nothing's there, there, there's certainly never going to be a magic bullet. It's all going to be about, you know, being consistent and being Building, in there. Right? It's ex exactly. One more step. I, yeah. I know that um, uh, Jack mentioned that his, um, that his company was, uh, was making sanitation stations. Um, we, as you know, we were basically um, product development and, and, and sales and marketing and customer service. And we use outside outside companies to do uh, our manufacturing for us. But uh, our, our primary third party manufacturers fund company, they are um, up in Wisconsin and, um, and they are currently working on a um, same type of thing, a sanitation station that would provide a, um, a, you know, wipes a hand, you know, a spray and a garbage can there so that if someone wanted to literally pick up a wipe and wipe down the machine before they played it, throw it out and do their hands, they could, they could do that. And so I, I think that all those types of things, either the foot operated one that Jack's talking about from Bob's or, or what fun companies doing, those things are going to be really important, particularly, particularly if we can maybe incorporate that with once they prove that these, these active, you know, it's something like alcohol, you wipe it down and it works while it's wet, but once it's dry, it's over. Right. But if you have something that you're wiping it down with, that'll become an active killer of viruses. I mean, that'll be one step farther. Right. Yeah, some disinfectants are much more long lived on surfaces than other ones. And so it's important to pay attention to what the manufacturer has put on their labels in terms of application and whatnot. Um, and so it really depends on the type of disinfectants that they put in. So yeah, I, I totally concur with what uh, Frank is saying there. Great. I'm gonna go ahead and take some questions from the audience. We've got some stacking up here. Um, this one's really for Mike and Jonah, as it has to do with uh, food service and um, uh, menus. Uh, any thought on a mobile app menu to replace disposable menus? We've got one in the, in the process of being developed for us by a company called Chow Now. Uh, they're the same company that put together our, um, our uh, ordering for our website. And so we've already got a an app available on, I, on uh, iTunes, but not for Android yet. We're hoping to have that this week. And is that live yet? Not live yet? It's, it's live for the uh, iPhone, but not for the Android. Got it. Jonah, any thoughts about that? 
I think it's it's a an idea that can certainly help. Um, you know, we're looking more so at how do we change some of our procedures. So, you know, instead of having a uh, full sit down dining experience, at least during the early stages, how can we make it so that perhaps there's a host stand and then that's where the actual order takes place. And then it's more of a, in some cases, either more of a grab and go, or there's just, you know, fewer, fewer options for what's available. Um, we, we feel that limiting some of the contact is about one of the few ways that we can try to help once people are in, in our facility. Right. Right. All right. So it's, it's again, one more tool in, in making that guest feel comfortable and in control, right? They have some control over it. Um, you know, they're empowered to a certain degree having an app. Yes. Yeah. Uh, John, I got a question that uh, you could probably help with um, from Charles Leonelli. Uh, he asks, I operate an arcade with about 100 machines. No food or drinks in the arcade. What do you think about giving each customer a mask if they don't have one or theirs doesn't look effective and a pair of nitrile ga gloves as they enter the arcade? With gloves on, it seems it would make them feel safer and they would not be bringing anything in on their hands. We would still be continually disinfecting the machines and our employees would also wear gloves and masks. And my, my question is, you know, if they get that material, the, the, the pathogen on their gloves, they're just as um, uh, potentially spreading the pathogen as whether they had the gloves on or not. And equally, you know, taking the gloves off, isn't there a procedure must be followed to properly take off a, a pair of gloves? Yeah, Peter, I, I should mention that my lab wasn't converted to work with COVID. Rather, what I'm doing is volunteering my services down at the vet school because they have, have accreditation to actually work. And so uh, I might have got that information to you incorrectly. I apologize for that. Um, yeah, you know, um, masks, definitively, I mean, um, you can see in Asian societies that they've been wearing masks for quite some time to prevent the flu. Um, some of these cities that they live in um, have population densities of 40,000 to 100,000 per square kilometer, I've read. And so if they're wearing masks, it makes sense to me that that's a good thing to have. Um, and just thinking it through, um, is it ultimately going to prevent you from getting infected? Maybe not, but it's another barrier protection that you can utilize in preventing yourself from getting infected. So I'm a big proponent of masks. When I walk around my building, I wear one of these. They are uncomfortable. There's no doubt about it. Jack was talking about people down in, in Florida and my glasses fog up just as Jack said. So, you know, how are people going to play a game when they're doing that? I don't know if there's anti-fogging agents you can put on your glasses, but yeah, gloves. So when I'm handling a sample, like I'll be doing tomorrow night, every now and then we get tubes that are leakers. So the health professionals haven't correctly, you know, tightened the, uh, the, 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 um, clinical samples before they send it to us. And so we have to handle those very gingerly, but we're underneath the hood. And, um, and so we work with gloves and also arm protectors. But as soon as I'm done handling that, putting it into a, a plastic bag, so then the molecular biology laboratory can go ahead and use that sample um, more uh, with, uh, first of all, they're, they're alerted to the fact that this was a leaker. So the outside might still be um, infectious or hot as we call it. And then what I do after that's done is I take my hands out from underneath the hood, I pull off my arm protectors, I pull off my gloves, and then I go and wash my hands. So no matter what, when you use gloves, you have to disinfect and wash after you remove the gloves. And so, you know, gloves are, uh, might provide confidence to individuals coming into these um, establishments and whatnot, but ultimately they still have to disinfect their hands when they remove them. So would it be then more effective to simply have hand sanitizer stations around um, as opposed to gloves yes. uh, and, and, and have it, the players continuously, you know, encouraged to use the hand sanitizers? Yeah, you know, but utilizing disinfection, as I've heard all of these incredible uh, business leaders talking about um, in terms of constantly disinfecting. I think I even heard Mike say that they change the cloth each time, a clean cloth. But if it has a, if it's soaked and disinfected, my argument would be that cloth will still be incredibly um, effective at killing the virus. And so Mike's going to an added extreme in terms of uh, making sure that everything's disinfected. But yeah, hand disinfection, you know, this is what prevents um, um, upper respiratory tract infections like the flu, like the common cold, like coronavirus. Coronavirus is not this super bug. You can kill it with good old alcohol, destroys it because it has a membrane on the outside. 
soap tears it apart. So each time you're washing your hands, think about the fact you're torturing that butt. <laughs> you're ripping it apart. It's like horses pulling someone apart during a Roman film. And so, um, so these antiseptics, antiseptics, are compounds you can put on the skin, okay? So these uh, alcohol-based hand rubs are one. Disinfectants are ones you can't necessarily put on the skin. You don't want people spraying themselves with Lysol. Um, I see this kind of stuff um, going on, but rather taking your clothes off if you feel you've been exposed and, and getting them washed um, appropriately will kill it. Um, so, so that's my two cents on that. Okay, thank you. Um, Dave Sexton makes a comment. He says, some local guidelines may require PPE, some will not. He thinks having it available will be important. Uh, I assume that the entire panel agrees having a, a good supply of PPEs available for your team members and for your guests uh, will be pretty much part of the SOP. Yeah, Pete, for us, uh, one, of the, one of the concerns we've had is we want to uh, provide our guests with face masks if they don't have them. And so we had face masks branded. Uh, so we've got Bone Daddy throwing on the mask. The problem is that we don't know whether or not we want our brand associated with a virus. <laughs> so, yeah, true that. We'll say, but at the same time, now our now the name of our company is on our mask. So we're not sure if that's a good idea or not. So Cheryl, you might be able to give me some insight on that. <laughs> actually, actually, Mike, we we've gone through the exact same thing where we we were about. We were about this close to ordering Pac-Man masks, you know, branded, you know, for the for the industry, and went. Wait a minute, you know, it's like, do we? It's like, do we really want them on there? I'm not so sure. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that's in a holding pattern right now. Cheryl, your thoughts on that? A good idea so gone wrong. The very, first, the very first thing that I would want to give out, even before I gave out the masks, I think everybody would appreciate it. Are those little hand sanitizers that you can buy yeah. that are just branded with your logo on it and flood the market with that. When we were at Amusement Expo, the booths that had those hand sanitizers, I never saw so many people rush booth yeah. as those booths. Yeah. So I think that's really, really good. And it is that, hey, do we really want it branded? Don't we want it? But what you can do is we looked at doing just all smiley faces all over it so that it's kind of fun and whimsical and they'll know that they got it from us or the different color bandanas that hey this week is the purple bandana so i'm going in because purple's my favorite color well i'm going to go back when they have the neon green or just something that would kind of make it yeah. interesting but when we asked a few minutes ago about you know is this do we have gloves up oh, is the dr Gaff. you I, might have started a new collection craze right yeah <laughs> You know, I think from a public health standpoint, your public health officials will applaud you guys for branding your masks and for putting them out there. I assure you um, that's going to put a very positive um, uh, uh, brand, if you will, on your own brand um, from a public health perspective. Um, so I personally, my own opinion is I love that idea uh, from a business perspective. I. I don't have a lot of experience with that. And I wanted to mention, I've mentioned that the virus is a wimp. It's a complete wimp. Not when it's inside your body, then it's not a whip, then it's not your friend. But outside the body, you can easily destroy this virus. Uh, Pete, on the, uh, Pete, on the marketing. Uh, yeah, go ahead. On the marketing, uh, on our hand sanitizer, my wife was the one who uh, came up with the stinky feet game that we've been making for years. And uh, she came up with a hand, you know, we need a hand sanitizer for our customers and what have yeah. you. So our idea was we, we may name our hand sanitizer Sticky Hands, okay? <laughs> <laughs> along with sticky feet. So I like it. That's great, <laughs> man. Does it dispense tickets I too? <laughs> I haven't sold her on that one yet, but. Uh, oh, yeah. That's great. Uh, that's good. I like that, Jack. That's wonderful. Jack, I got a question for you um, uh, and Frank as well as manufacturers. And really operators as well. Joan, I think you might have some input on this. Um, you know, um, uh, density of games and multiplayer games are a, a big topic of conversation. Are we going to have to start removing games from our locations to maintain social, uh, a, a proper social distancing? Equally, will multiplayer games need to be modified in some way, shape, or form to protect one player from the other from aerosol 
containment or contamination. Jack and Frank, have you guys uh, thought about that on multiplayer games? And to you, Jonah, have you thought about it uh, within your facility of creating some kind of a barrier uh, between uh, game stations so you don't have to lose that density and that wow factor within the room? Uh, you know, uh, Pete, for, for Bob Space Racer, you know, we are the, uh, we've been making group games with multiplayer games for a long, long time here. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that's very confusing for us is uh, this uh, all came about in a three-week period. So it's very confusing as to what the industry is really going to need. I mean, when we're talking about hand sanitizers, masks, uh, you know, there's there, one day you turn on the TV and they tell you to wear a mask. The next day they tell you the mask is no good. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things being advertised as far as to kill the kill the virus, but it's not tested. So it's very confusing as to what what is really the official word on this. Okay, what should we officially do, and how long will that be? So you know, if we're talking about years down the road, uh, a person is not going to be able to take in and build buy a game with a big spread center uh, if it's not necessary two years from now. And if they have existing product already, it you know we have to modify something to do that. But it is a it is a it's going to be very interesting where we go with all this. It's just a matter of it's come up uh, come about so fast on us, and there are so many things that change every day with it. It's really hard to get a handle on what we're truly going to need to do about this. Frank, can you yeah, speak what, to that from the manufacturing yeah, what, perspective? What what we've been looking at, and, and we kind of try to analyze what our players do and how they play, right? And typically, if you have a, um, and, and this isn't 100% of the time, of course, but but I would say on a majority basis, if you have a, a game where people play together, a social game, they have come in together. They are, it's not like I just walked into a location and I'm going to get next, but long before a virus, right? I'm not going to go yeah, get right. shoulder to shoulder with somebody who I don't know and, and play a game with them, right? So the people who are playing a social game are playing together. The ones that we're kind of looking at are the ones that we have the multiplayer games like, you know, we, we do things like, you know, DC Comics or Red Zone Rush, right? Where you have four player stations that aren't necessarily six feet apart. You know, it's like, do we need to come up with some type of, you know, plastic screening that that'll go on the diagonals or something to right. to provide some additional additional help for for those people who are playing those games who won't necessarily since you're not cooperating you're not actually playing together but you're still on one game in that space that's less than six feet apart so um so we might you know going forward certainly we'd be thinking along those lines and certainly also kind of retroactively try to find something to to help with that we the way i look at the the situation we're all looking at right is is that our our primary focus at this point in time certainly is has always been product development but but there's so many products that are out there right now that people are going to need help making other people feel comfortable with right it's it's whether whether or not it's um whether or not it's a the safety du jour kind of thing, right? Whether it's like, to, to, okay, like Jack said, today it's this, tomorrow it's the next thing. You know, it's the perception of I'm comfortable going here because this is what they've done. And those are the kind of things that we're looking at. Mm. Jonah, to you, and, and that also, uh, Mike, is, is there a, a, Jonah and Mike, you can both kind of speak to this. Is there a, uh, you know, are you planning to uh, socially distance the games or are you planning on putting a barrier? Equally, are you doing anything with your point of sale uh, areas where you are putting a barrier between the uh, staff member and the guest? Sure. So I'll talk about the games first. And as I mentioned, we're not ready to open. It's one of the reasons, in fact, why we see that there's still going to be some lag between when businesses are allowed to open and when we choose to open. So I, I do believe that there's a difference between opening and opening safely and then let alone opening profitably. So for us, you know, it's still a bit down the road, but what we're looking at and, and what I think a number of others in the industry are doing is for us, once people come to our facility, you know, they're, they're taking some degree of risk per se. Um, so we're only going to get people who feel comfortable in the environment of, Hey, you are coming to an entertainment center. As far as our games, we have large footprints. Our games aren't sectioned off to a particular section. They're spread out throughout our large hundred thousand plus facilities. 
Um, so we have some separation built in there, but what, what I've heard from a lot of other operators is, is they are looking at either turning off certain games, spacing their games out further. In some cases, they are taking out games. There are a couple of games that we have on our floor that as we do open in the early phases, we will not have out on our floor. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about turning their card readers off on certain games. Um, I, I think that we're going to learn a lot, especially here in Ohio and Pennsylvania, where we may not be, you know, the earliest to reopen. We were among the first to close and uh, will probably be towards the end of reopening. But, but I do believe that the key here is when a guest comes in, are we showing empathy and are we showing that we've taken a number of precautionary steps to try our best to help them feel comfortable? And I think a perfect example of this is, uh, I mentioned it to my team, you know, last, last week I went to pick up some pizza from a, from a restaurant, chain restaurant, and I haven't been going out all that much, but I, I went in to uh, pick up the pizza and none of their employees were wearing masks, mm. none had gloves, uh, no signage. And my feeling right then and there was, I am not comfortable here. If we can kind of turn that around so that when guests do come in, they, they see that we've spent all of this time, weeks, months of effort, pouring into the safety of our guests and our team members, the better off we'll be. We'll never be able to mitigate all risks. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to do my part to delay that opening, but the safety and the comfort of our guests, I think, is what we truly have to focus in on. That, that's the trust factor right there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had an experience. I've been in my restaurant, my own restaurants, since we opened, and I see all these extra steps that we're taking to keep our guests safe and keep our employees safe, and I feel really good about it. But yesterday was the first time. It was my granddaughter's birthday, so we went to, she wanted to go to Chili's, so we went to Chili's. And there were probably only about five other parties in the restaurant. Everybody's wearing masks, they're sanitizer at the front door, someone opened the door for me. All the steps that we're taking in our restaurant, they were taking in theirs. And I've, I had the creeps as a guest the entire time I was there. Huh. Every, every time I turned around, I was reminded of the fact that there's a virus potentially floating around in this restaurant. And I can't eat with a mask on. So it was my first time to go out as a consumer and be exposed to a restaurant. And I personally did not feel safe at all, regardless of all the steps that they were taking. And I think that's right. something that we're really going to have to overcome. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's questions about where we can find hand sanitizers. Uh, John, you had put some information out about that. Uh, and also, I know that some of our own suppliers are in uh, are, are assisting with a, a, num a lot of PPEs. I know Suzo Hap is involved with that, as well as some other uh, suppliers. So we'll put a list together of what those would be, uh, and share those with uh, uh, with the attendees uh, after the fact as to where they can get PPEs and some of the hand sanitizing products uh, necessary. Um, John, a, a question that's come up, um, um, and it's kind of like thought of as perhaps built in, building it into a piece of equipment uh, going forward, UV lighting. Uh, there's been talk about the effectiveness of UV lighting. And what I'm told is that the stuff that's used for medical level cleaning uh, is unsafe for humans. It'll hurt your eyes, it'll give you skin burns and so forth. Uh, is there a level of UV lighting that is safe for humans that could be incorporated into a game, say, for instance, that showed down on a control panel? And it might not completely uh, eradicate the, uh, the virus. You need a certain amount of dwell time of that light to do so. But again, it's just one more step in, in minimizing uh, the potential for cont contamination. Is, is there any lighting out there that you're aware of that's effective in that regard? Yeah, UV lighting is incredibly effective at killing microbes, period. But it's also incredibly effective at causing skin cancers. Yeah. So that's why we wear sunscreen, guys. We don't want to expose ourselves to UV light sources. So when I'm done underneath the hood after, you know, handling, you know, 100 or 200 COVID samples, at the end of the night, I clean everything off, first of all, with ethanol before I remove my gloves, all the surfaces that I can touch, including, you know, handles and underneath where my legs were and everything. And then what I do is I close 
the glass shield, and then I press a button, and a UV light source comes on. It stays on anywhere from you know uh, 10 minutes to 25 minutes, and then it turns off. But UV light only to kill stuff on the surface. It doesn't penetrate the steel um, in the hood or doesn't penetrate the glass back at me uh, because it's blocked from doing that. So, I mean, it's possible that you could use a UV light source to actually eradicate uh, potential pathogens on the surface of your equipment. Um, and that might be something that's usable, but you would never ever want to expose your customers to something like that. Got it, so no, it's, not a, it's effective in a, uh in a uh, uh, controlled environment, uh, not as a, uh, uh, as a con constant in a, in a populated uh, 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 environment. Correct, and it, it'll pull apart some materials as well. It'll actually photo oxidize them is my understanding. Okay. And so there is that John, possibility as well. John, I, I read something just, just last week about um, far UV, um, UV that's far enough down the, down the spectrum, so to speak, so that it so that it's no longer harmful to the cornea, no longer harmful harmful to skin, but still has um, antimicrobial benefits of some sort. Is that do uh, you have any experience with that? Well, Frank, you know something that I don't know, so we'll start <laughs> with that. But I know your traditional UV sources are incredibly effective at killing microbes, but I I, I don't know about that, Frank. I okay. Yeah, it's it's I, I, I am again aware. I. I I, I know it's something that's relatively it's 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 along with everything else that's popping up right now. But uh, it's so it's relatively it's newer. But yeah, there there are some articles out there about um, something called far UV. And again, I don't know how strong it is compared to the current stuff that's on the market. But yeah, theoretically, does not hurt your eyes, does not hurt your skin, and yet it's it is it's still UV and still can have some antimicrobial benefits. Yeah, you're talking about UVC, you're talking about sterilizers, but those type of sterilizers, my understanding is they're still only used for surfaces. So you don't expose your, your own, you don't expose your skin to them. Uh, but I can check up on that, Frank. And oh, no, I, no, again, I'm not suggesting, like, I'm, I'm more talking about what Pete is saying, that, uh, that if you were to have something where it was, if it was shining down on a surface of a, of a game or something like that, um, right. would it be, you know, and in addition to the fact that it's constantly shining on the controls of a game, it won't harm a human who's playing the game so that it's actively working on, on disinfecting, so to speak, but not, um, but not hurting anyone who might happen to be playing it. Yeah, I've, I've actually read a couple of manuscripts on using different far right. Now you were making me think this one through in terms of uh, killing staph aureus or killing bacterial pathogens. And uh, they demonstrate that it effectively kills them and induces particular responses which are related to UV exposure as well. And so um, I'd, I'd have to look a, a little bit more into that in terms of the actual science associated with it, as opposed to what I'm looking at right now, which is a lot of hype that I see on my, uh, my website here. But um, I'll look into it, Frank. Thanks. Yeah, thank yeah, you. And, and, and in fact, and, uh, and you're 100%, all... sorry, you're all 100% correct as well. I mean, we would have to be thinking about changing some of the materials that we currently use because yeah, a constant exposure to UV would just shatter the, you know, the vinyl and the artwork and stuff like that that's on the panels. I mean, it would be, we would have to be redesigning that as well. And I, I keep hearing a lot about these disinfectants from these business leaders. I, you know, apparently the application, the way you guys are talking about it, seems to me like you're getting the job done and UV light might not help. You know, I, just disinfecting might be uh, much more effective. Um, I also, I, I don't know what the costs are between the two. Disinfectant sounds to me like it might be a little bit cheaper than setting up these kind of things. But, you know, th th I want to make sure that everyone at this meeting understands UV radiation is not good for you. You want to avoid contact with it at all costs, all mm. the time. You know, when I lived in Western Australia, they had a, a saying they'd show on the TV, slip, slap, slap. And what that meant, that's what you do with sunscreen because they have the highest levels of melanoma in Western Australia where I lived for four years and we lived by it. And, and all the kids wore these Legionnaires hats and they had full body um, uh, swimsuits, you know, including covering the legs and the arms. So they were very attuned to the absolute uh, power of UV radiation, in this case coming from the sun as opposed to a, a, a UV light source. So. One thing on the from the manufacturing side, you know, we're talking about uh, new products, new uh, materials, separating the players. Uh, you know, we have a ton of equipment throughout the world that it would everything would have to be retrofitted. So if you do come up with some new materials, new ideas, UV, uh, you know, for someone to get open, 
they're still going to have to sanitize because all the equipment they have is uh, is not going to be able to be adapted to any type of uh, new type system like a new product would be able to be. Uh, this kind of uh, thanks, Jack. Uh, there's a a question uh, put out there that uh, I've had a a, um, a number of times, and it kind of leads into a question that I'd organized earlier. Um, think about uh, games that use um, an element of the game. A, a, a ski ball uses a ball, a bowling ball and bowling, um, a ball crawl space uh, for gymnastic schools, the foam pits and so forth. Um, and maybe there are some of those in ninja um, uh, courses and so forth. Um, first of all, have you thought about what it's going to take to sanitize those? And is there a, uh, a cost benefit point where you get to where you say, I'm not going to open that attraction again. I'm going to have to figure out something to do with that space. Um, and uh, equally for, for those, you know, those uh, things like bowling balls and so forth, uh, uh, control elements of a game, what are the thoughts with how we're going to be able to make those uh, clean? I've had um, a, a hygienist, a hygienist uh, industrial hygienist, uh, spoke to us uh, two weeks ago on a webinar who said the, the thing that you have to know is that until you touch a, a uh, um, an entry point of your body, you're not going to be introducing the virus unless you've got a cut on your hand. Um, if you have a sanitation station right next to that machine the player can then use, uh, that's going to be effective in uh, thwarting any of, the, uh, any of the pathogen that may have gotten their hands while they're playing the game. But important, I'm sure, is gonna, are players going to want to pick up a, a plastic dart? Are they going to want to pick up a bowling ball? So, Jonah, thoughts about that? What are, what are, you, what are you thinking in terms of <laughs> those kind of products? I mean, that's certainly right in your wheelhouse. Sure. So uh, definitely difficult, right? Um, you know, from a bowling perspective, we are going to be uh, distributing the balls differently. You know, that instead of having the racks lined up, we will find a way for our counter to essentially be the conduit for those balls, ensuring that they're sanitized and cleaned and so forth. Um, you know, I, I even before the virus, to be honest, I always wonder, well, people are bowling and then they're eating their food at the same time. It seems like, aren't, aren't people worried about the germs? And now I'm just hypersensitive to that. Are people going to want to do that exact thing? And I don't know. I don't know. Is it going to change? Perhaps with some time, but, you know, right out of the gate, I just, I see that part being a bit difficult for people to get, wrap their, their, their head around. Um, you know, when it comes to the ski balls and the basketballs, we've, we've thought about turning those particular games off, but ultimately we feel, you know, it's a part of the reason why people may be coming to our facilities. So we look at just having the sanitizers near there and different stations throughout the facility to better allow our guests and team members to uh, clean, clean after they play. And maybe some signage to encourage, hey, wash your hands after playing this game. Correct. So we actually intend to have signage throughout our facilities, including at each of the attractions, with what our procedures are for those attractions. That's good. That's good. No, Pete, Peter, you asked an interesting question before this in terms of the ball pits, the foam pits. The IETP, the Trampoline Park Association, on the call last week, that how many people are going to keep that attraction as it is right now. And about a third of the people I talked to after the call said, bomb pits and we're going to put a bag jump in. They said, we didn't think it was that easy to clean before this. Now we really think it's hard to clean. You know, our, and I saw you put up a poll, you know, how do you clean that rock wall after somebody's been up and down? So there are certain attractions that are going to be more challenging. And I think if we're open and honest with the public and say, for your safety, even though this is your favorite thing that you post hours to do, we told everybody on social media platform, here are the things that we just are not comfortable open yet for your safety. Mm. It's just we don't want you to have fun, but we know you will have somebody walk and say, but I. I'm oh, sorry, Beth. Uh, Cheryl, you're on my. Your your uh your your audio is kind of uh, uh getting hard to understand. I'm sorry about that. Technology, right? Probably your neighbor turned yeah. on their Wi-Fi, right? <laughs> uh, 
There's a there's a couple of uh, suggestions. Beth Stanley uh, put one out that said that um, they've been taking out. Uh, uh, there's some folks that said that they're taking uh, they're putting fewer skee balls and basketballs uh, in the game, so there's fewer to sanitize. Uh, maybe that affects the uh, the attraction of the game. I don't know. Um, bowling show rentals and socks. Jonah, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, uh, again, I think some people are going to have a comfort level and for that, we're still going to continue with our sanitation procedure for the shoes. Uh, I've seen a lot of centers also do the little boots that you can put over your, your own shoes. So, uh, I, I think we're still trying to wrestle with what that best procedure is. But again, I think people who are coming are going to take a certain degree of understanding, Hey, this is what a bowling facility does. Uh, but I think also part of the communication before they even get to our facilities is also encouraging guests to do the, to do certain things. If, if it makes them more comfortable to have their own ball, to have their own shoes, you know, let them bring their own. Yeah. 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 Um, and, uh, you know, uh, John, a question came up about um, ozone machines as a disinfectant before and after the location opens. Is there any um, uh, curative or um, uh, pathogen killing component to uh, ozone machines? Yeah, overall, I'm just, I saw that question and right away I went to an EPA website. You know, is there such a thing as good ozone and bad ozone I'm reading? Um, and it, it, it doesn't really seem to me that there's a lot of good um, regarding ozone in terms of its effect on human health. Um, I don't know, do you guys actually use ozone generators now to disinfect surfaces or disinfect machines or other kinds of things? And I don't know what the effects chemically are of ozone are for these sensitive types of machines as well. Um, so it's a little bit um, out of my wheelhouse, but um, I think that I'm finding just from what I'm reading here, and I'll send it out to everyone, is that um, you know there is no evidence to show that at concentrations that do not exceed public health standards, ozone is not effective at removing many odor causing chemicals. Um, if used at concentrations that do not exceed public health standards, ozone applied to indoor air does not effectively remove viruses, bacteria, mold, or other biological pollutants. So it seems to me you're damned if you do and you're damned if you're overdue um, in this case. And so uh, I'm not hearing that, that ozone um, first of all, is non-toxic and causes a lot of uh, effects on human beings. And, um, and once again, I go back to that ability to disinfect um, um, on the outside surfaces and whatnot um, seems to be the most effective thing moving forward. John, uh, we talked about UV a while back and how it's not um, uh, recommended, certainly in any populated space at the levels necessary to uh, uh, be a preventive measure. Uh, what about on a, um, uh, an HVAC system? where the incoming air uh, is uh, exposed to uh, um, uh, ultraviolet light. Would, would that have uh, a, uh, would, I, I'm, you know, people are still gonna be bringing the virus in and pathogens inside the building, but would uh, having a, the air circulating within the building uh, coming through, you know, something even better than a HEPA filter, 99% cured of, uh, of uh, pathogens, is that an effective uh, measure? It's not cheap, but I know of some uh, uh, manufacturers who have talked about already uh, bringing that into their facilities. Are you aware of the effectiveness of that? Well, UV light will kill anything. And so that would be effective. But then you got to think about other uh, characteristics. How long is UV light applied? You know, what's the airflow? And so you'd want to talk to the manufacturers and you'd want to see evidence uh, to demonstrate that these systems are effective in terms of preventing uh, a potential exposure to infectious agents. And so, you know, you'd want to do your homework on them. Mm. Yeah, and I just had a, 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 you could speak to this clarification. Some UV lighting can create ozone, and this is not something you want guests breathing. Correct. Yeah, okay, got it. So maybe that's not such a great idea. Um, so one of the videos that I was watching to two of the companies, I hope I'm not breaking up, or maybe I am. Yeah, go nuts. Go ahead. You're doing great. Um, is that they are, their protocol are saying, yes, you're still going to disinfect during the day, and you're going to wipe and do everything you possibly can. But once you close, if that's when you put out your UV lights and you set them and it takes at least 15 minute timers to hit each area and then you would switch it to another area. And I thought maybe for the birthday party rooms and places that 
are really hard to get. These kids put their hands everywhere. So yeah. maybe that's just a great application for those thoughts. I, Cheryl, I didn't hear the whole part of that question. I was paying attention to something else. Could you say that one more time, please? No, absolutely. So the question is, while you're doing daily cleaning and you're wiping and you're disinfecting and you can use the new spray and the fox and everything, what if at the end of the day, you had the UV light system? Because I looked at two of the big, big, big office buildings that are going to do this, and they're going to put them out at the end of the night on rotation for 15 minutes and then switch it to another main office area. So the toughest areas to clean, I think, between the kitchen with all the touching and the birthday party rooms and areas that get little kids to touch everywhere. Would that be a, like a double combination of good use? Well, well, as long as the surfaces aren't porous, you know, so microbes can get in there, um, you know, because once again, UV radiation works on the surface, okay? That's, how, that's what it effectively kills. It doesn't penetrate below the surface. Um, and so it um, sounds to me like it would be a, an added benefit. Once again, you know, cost benefit um, would have to be applied there in terms of just using typical disinfectants. Well, I know that I there also, are some I, hotel chains that are, are uh, starting to, this as part of their uh, cleaning protocol. Um, hospital rooms are doing that, obviously. Yes, and so they on. do. So, yeah. And so do laboratories. But, yeah. but, but aren't, those, aren't those all manual? I mean, not, not like an, it's not something you could just shine on a room. It would have to almost be like in a wand because especially with kids, they're touching under things and around things and whatever else. You would have to literally be covering all sides of everything. You can't just shine a light on a room because anything that's in a shadow, so to speak, right, is, <laughs> is, is, is it would just be, again, I'm not... I, I think that it, it points back to what John had said earlier that uh, that because of the fact that the benefits don't appear to be better than just cleaning the surfaces down, you know, you're you may be spending a bunch of money for a system that's not going to be able to reach the areas that you want to take care of the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to switch gears from the sanitation for a moment and talk about uh, restaffing, right? We've got to bring people back on board. It's got to be a tiered uh, program. Mike talked about uh, one restaurant open at 25% capacity, so I'm sure he's got an, um, um, an equal uh, percentage of uh, staff on hand. Um, the staff was uh, 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 let go in many facilities, probably one of the most difficult decisions many business leaders have had to, ha had to make, and, and certainly a reality check of just how, how um, devastating this, this, uh, uh, this pathogen, this pandemic has been. But the, the federal government has uh, uh, assist, put an assisted program together for uh, the unemployed to add another $600 in their paycheck, and that's good for 13 weeks. Um, some of these areas are going to be opening sooner than that um, uh, $600 uh, uh, kicker is, uh, is included. W how are you uh, managing that? What are you doing for re you know, re uh, bringing people back on board when they're looking at the paycheck when they were within the facility and looking at this extra 600 bucks and saying, I'm out, you know, I'm, I'm losing money on, on this deal. I, I think I might want to stay on uh, unemployment. Mike, can you speak to that? What, 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 what have, you've already had to bring people back. So has that been a struggle for you? And have, how have you addressed it? I apologize, I was muted. It has been a struggle and I didn't even, uh, never even occurred to us that that was gonna be an issue until we started calling our employees back and told them that we were ready to open that one restaurant. Um, we selected that restaurant for a couple reasons. One, again, it was our most popular, or it was our busiest restaurant, but we also, when we first shut it down, I was getting more uh, requests from that team to get the restaurant back open than any other team. So we felt like we were doing it in large part to benefit the people that wanted to come back to work. And then when it came time to get them back in, that's when we started hearing, I'm not ready to come back to work. I make less money if I come back to work than I do staying on unemployment. And so I'll just stay on unemployment until it runs out. The people that have come back to work are people that either weren't getting unemployment because they weren't eligible for it. Uh, there are certain people in certain age groups that weren't able to get unemployment. So they've come back. And we've also had to bring people in from our other, other locations to support that one location. But it's been difficult. It would be almost impossible for us to re reopen all of our restaurants, given that one uh, issue that we're facing right now. Unexpected, I'm sure. Yeah, it was unexpected. Yeah. 
Johnny, any thoughts on that? You, you, you know, I know you're a little ways from opening, but that's, you know, the, that, that unemployment uh, kicker is still going to be in there, you know, by the time you start, you know, ramping up. Yeah, so I, I definitely think it's, it's a temporary challenge that certainly we're all facing. Um, I think really all we can do is hope that we've provided a safe environment for our team to want to come back to what they love doing. Uh, it, it is it is a challenge, no doubt. I, I did see something earlier today, and I, I didn't get a chance to read the whole article, but I think in Ohio, they, there's some kind of portal or, or some kind of website now where you can actually report those who have refused to come back to work. Now, you know, I'm sure there are legitimate excuses, you know, health and the safety and so forth. So I don't really know to what extent that's going to work. But it sounds like, you know, the government is also in tune to some of these incentives that they placed and how it's going to feed through the system. Yeah. My concern with that is, do I really want to bring an employee back, force an employee back into my restaurant and have that employee interacting with my guests when they correct pissed off about being forced back in? Exactly. I mean, it, it's a hard, it's a hard one to solve. And you know, my, you're further ahead in the process than we are. So my, my hope is that uh, our team just loves what they've been doing so much and that they feel that we're taking the precautions to create the safe environment that this is what they want to be doing. Um, we've, uh, we've reached the, the limit of the, the webinar for today, but I want to go one more question because it's an important one. Um, and first, I want to thank everybody on the panel and all the attendees for showing up. This has been uh, quite a great exchange. Uh, we will have this available and send out uh, a, um, an email with a link to it to all participants. We'll post it on our website as well as on our Facebook page. So you, uh, you'll have access to this um, um, after the fact. But the question that I, I want to ask in closing is um, uh, pricing. Um, you know, you've taken quite a hit over these last eight weeks and, and longer. Um, you know, what, what's going to happen with your pricing, with your party programs? Uh, what, how are you going to be um, uh, addressing raising prices, lowering, pr lowering prices, adding incentive for employees? I mean, all of the things that come into the pricing structure. Jonah and, and Mike, what, have you, uh, what are you doing with regard to uh, your, uh, your pricing prep uh, programs for parties and for just general uh, access to the facility? Our pricing hasn't uh, changed at all. Uh, we just went back to our standard menu and we reopened. Uh, our biggest concern now is being able to keep our prices at what they are uh, just because of all the issues that are uh, going on at meatpacking plants right now. Yeah. Uh, we assume that that's gonna run prices up uh, before the end of the year and we may have to take additional pricing on our menus uh, just to make it, you know, worth our while to stay open. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I think that there are going to be some changes to menus uh, across the country, at least in the, in the near term, because of the, the cost of goods. Uh, you know, it's, as far as attractions, we're, we're not so much changing our pricing, but we are looking at how we get people through each of those attractions. Um, you know, I, I think in some areas where we are seeing uh, in the past, significant demand, we, we've, we've shied away from pricing in favor of uh, trying to continue to modify our procedures. And, and I think that's what we're going to have to do now. I think people are going to be uh, sensitive to spending money during the economic recovery. And uh, I think we have to keep that in mind as, as we proceed into an opening phase. Yeah. Well, with that, um, I can't thank you folks enough for participating. Jack, thank you. Dr. John, thank you. Jonah, thank you. Mike, thank you. Cheryl, thank you. Frank, <laughs> thank you. Um, all the way around well, the board. Thank you. Tina, thank you <laughs> thank for putting you. this together. Um, we'll be having another uh, webinar next week on Tuesday uh, on a similar topic. Um, but, you know, the way things are changing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it's blur day to blur day. So we really don't know what we're dealing with. Um, but again, thank you, panelists. Thank you, attendees. Uh, we'll speak to you again next week. Everyone be safe, be well, and uh, I'll leave you with this. Um, obviously, uh, like many of us, I've been involved with a lot of these Zoom meetings over the past few days uh, and weeks, and I'm, I'm struck by two things, the enormous impact this has had on our industry, um, and, and really hearing it from individuals like Jonah and Mike, uh, who have facilities where they're employing hundreds of people and, and all of a sudden having their cash flow completely shut down. That's just a, 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 you didn't expect this and there's no playbook for it. But what I'm also struck by is the tenacity and the absolute belief that we will beat this thing. 
uh, that, yeah, you knocked us down and it hurt, but man, we're coming back and we're going to make this work. So um, we'll be there with you all the way, uh, all the way, and uh, we can't get there soon enough. Again, thanks everyone for participating. Have yourself a safe and blessed day. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Bye -bye. Pete. Take care, everyone. Thanks again.